Hello everyone. I'm Nakwe. And I'm Pietro. And we are the birds of play. As two married men who play Final Fantasy, our wives keep telling us that all the male characters look like girls. But what's manlier than a beard? So we went looking for the best beards in the Final Fantasy series. Every man on this list having something special to offer when it comes to the world of facial hair. Their own special brand of je ne sais quoi. And choosing between them was no easy task. Make sure to yell at us and voice your displeasure and outrage in the comments. And if you either hate, love or are ambivalent on the topic of beards, make sure to hit that subscribe button as hard as you can for some more Final Fantasy content. But without further ado, let's go through some beards. Number 5. Captain Bash von Ronsenberg of Dalmaska from Final Fantasy XII. No, not that Captain Bash. No, not that one either. Ah, perfect. When it comes to facial hair, it is rare to find someone who can pull off an unkept beard, left to the full discretion of nature. However, as Bash is captured and hung up to dry, deep in the Nalbina dungeons, he effortlessly manages to conjure forth an impressive lion's mane. Rawr! Coupled with his malnourished body, marred by both negligence and direct torture at the hands of his captors, the ever-proud captain of the Knights of Dalmasca rocks a look that is simultaneously vulnerable yet majestic. The same look that has maintained none other than Jesus Christ of Nazareth as a fashion icon for more than two millennia. But do not be fooled into thinking that this style is for you, just because Jesus and Bash can pull it off. After all, you wouldn't try to walk on water, and you're even less likely to prove your innocence after having been framed for reticide. So just enjoy the beard while it lasts, for just as great kingdoms must one day fall to ruin, so too do men shave even the mightiest of whiskers. Number 4. Sid Fabul the Ninth from Final Fantasy IX. Sid Fabul is the epitome of class, selflessness, and marital virtue. When he's not cheating on his wife, Sid is acting ruler of Lindblom, a large castle city on the southernmost part of the Mist continent. Sid is an accomplished airship designer and is the mastermind behind the Hildegard 1 and 2. Their sleek aerodynamic lines and thrusting presence are quite the sight to behold. This, of course, very much mirrored by his mighty moustache and beard, a masterpiece of geometric design and titillating lust. Sid's beard is a cut above the rest. A famous symbol of virility and masculinity, Sid takes great pride in the upkeep and legacy of his mighty upper lip crescent moon and meticulously shaped chin strap. We sadly have no knowledge of what or which products Sid used to hold such a firm shape for extended periods of time. But I like to think it's Oglop oil. This hypothesis is reaffirmed by the fact that even when Sid himself is transformed into an Oglop, his mighty moustache still stays proud and erect, even in the most perilous of situations. Truly a man of many talents, Sid and his beard surely deserve a place in the pantheon of magnificent facial hair. Number 3. Root from Final Fantasy VII Remake Despite his name, Rude's beard is nothing if not civil, proudly displaying his professionalism for all to see. Furthermore, Rude's immaculately well-kept hat demonstrates his commitment to relentless grooming as he puts each hair in its rightful place. Some might claim that someone like Andrea Rodea, who also sports a meticulously maintained beard, wears it better. But Rude makes the list on account of the fine line he walks, with no room for error. For unlike Andrea, Rude's true beard potential is completely shrouded in mystery, as he only lets us see what he wants us to see, the same applying to the shaving of his head. In this way, Rude shows us that you don't need to be endowed with perfect beard growth in order to have a winning beard. You just need to tame the beast you have lying dormant within you. It is also a reminder that beards are often more of a hobby for men than a way to get girls. Although, not falling for a terrorist you've been contracted to kill might make things a bit easier. Number 2. Ramu Ah, Ramu, the wise master of lightning, 
the hirsute, heaven's god himself, the beard daddy. Now you might ask yourself how a beard as mighty as this isn't at the top of our list. While it is true that Ramu's beard is magnificent, voluminous, and indeed mighty, putting most other beards to shame, it is also wild, untamed, and without a certain level of discipline that one has come to expect at this level of beard play. Don't get me wrong, in terms of sheer volume and presence, Ramu stands in a league of his own, but upkeep, maintenance and styling are just as important, if not more so, when judging the quality of beards. Very impressive, Ramu, but size isn't everything. Honorable mentions, Hironobu Sakaguchi. No list of best Final Fantasy beards would be complete without at least acknowledging the creator of Final Fantasy himself, who has been rocking some iconic facial hair for the majority of his career. But this isn't just an impressive cookie duster, tea strainer, or clam comb grown under hostile conditions in a country where facial hair is generally frowned upon. No, it is actually a symbol of camaraderie and bromance as Sakaguchi's mustache actually has a notable counterpart adorning the face of none other than the legendary composer Nobuo Uematsu, Sakaguchi having convinced Uematsu to grow a mustache with him as they were working on Final Fantasy III back in the day. After they both grew their respective stashes, Uematsu even claimed that the new look helped him command the respect of the audio team working under him despite his otherwise youthful looks. So I guess you could say that the quality of Uematsu's music is at least partially indebted to his upper lip coverage. As such, the enduring legacy of Sakaguchi's facial hair is a visual reminder of the franchise's roots and a dignified expression of the friendship underlying the magic we have come to know and love. Happy 60th birthday to Sakaguchi! Number, Number 1, one. Heidegger from, from Final, Final Fantasy, Fantasy VII Remake. Remake At the top of our list stands Heidegger, the high-level Shinra Electric Power Company executive. Though perhaps not as impressive in sheer size or over-the-top grooming, Heidegger's beard embodies the strength of a timeless classic. For, just like Coco Chanel's little black dress, Heidegger's beard is a perfect fit for any occasion. Its understated fullness, clean lines, and meticulous shaping gives off the air of authority, power, and composed masculinity. With just enough irregularity to let everyone know that here is a man that still has a wild side that you don't want to be on the wrong side of. Heidegger's beard is a classic concept coupled with a flawless execution. He stuck the landing and it's a 10 out of 10 from us. Welcome to Top 5 Final Fantasy. I'm Nakwe. And I'm Peter. And we are the Birds of Play. play. For the first time in Top 5 Final Fantasy history, we're going to be showing both sides of the coin. The best and the worst, by ranking the top 5 rad dads, as well as the top 5 bad dads from the series. All the while exploring the concept of fatherhood in Final Fantasy. If you end up liking the video, don't forget to subscribe to the channel if you haven't already and join the birdhouse, becoming a part of our growing Final Fantasy family. But without further ado, Let's talk about dads. Why aren't you proud of me, dad? Bad dad number five. Jacked from Final Fantasy X. As a father, Jacked is emotionally abusive to his son, Titus, giving him the nickname Crybaby and frequently belittling him. Somewhat of a narcissist, Jacked is arrogant and gives off the impression that he cares more about his Blitzball career than he does about his own son not to mention his alcoholic tendencies, immortalizing his attacking of the shoe puff. Jack's age is unknown, but judging by the fact that he is an athlete in his prime when he disappeared, one could imagine that he had Titus when he was still relatively young. Therefore, he might still have had a fair bit of going up to do, and like many such parents, he matures along with his child. Jack's methods may have been controversial, but he does seem to genuinely care for Titus. His bullying, at least, partly intended to desensitize him to adversity and to toughen him up. 
No matter how good his intentions may have been, however, his actions were misguided. And no matter the ultimate effect they may have had on Titus, Jack still failed to create a nurturing environment for his child at a young age. Rad Dad number 5 Bartholomew S. Time from Final Fantasy XIII Better known as Hope's Dad, Bartholomew is a minor character that nevertheless manages to leave a big impression, at least on the spectrum of Final Fantasy fathers. For someone on the positive side of fatherhood, however, his relationship with Hope is fairly strained due to him generally not being able to express his love for his wife and son. This leads Hope to being nervous about returning home, since he doesn't know how his father will react to all that has happened and to what he has become. I'm sure that many can relate, even though most problems a child might be afraid to bring home to its parents are more mundane than what Hope is going through. As the lost son returns home, however, he is welcomed with open arms and made perfectly aware that this is his home and that he will always be welcome there. Aww. Bad Dad number 4 Barrett from Final Fantasy VII An adoptive father to Marlene, Barrett is a man that might benefit from rethinking his priorities, especially since his daughter has already lost one father. It might be considered healthy for a parent and child to get some time apart, the child adjusting to new circumstances as is left in the care of another, and the parent getting some much needed me time to work on themselves. However, when you leave your child in a bar in the slums, and your me time consists mainly of terrorist activity, your crowning achievement being blowing up a power plant, then you're probably doing something wrong. Not to mention Barrett's decision to leave Marlene behind with a woman he barely knows as he goes on in his own adventure. Take a seat on the school board, Barrett, or an active role in local government, a fact change in your neighborhood, and leave the planet saving to someone else. Rad Dad number 4 Barrett from Final Fantasy VII Barrett might not be the perfect dad, but he is a very loving father and proves that it isn't necessary to be related by blood in order to care for a child as your own. Also, he believes that what he is doing is at least partly for Marlene's sake, even though it's also partly fueled by the hope for revenge against Shinra. If you're going to take parenting advice from Barrett, maybe you should leave it at just how to love your child and find other role models for how to be there for your child. Bad Dad Number 3 Dr. Sid from Final Fantasy XII Sidolfus Demon Bonanza Better known as Dr. Sid, is a brilliant man responsible for supplying the Empire with much of the technology required for its rapid expansion. As a father, however, he is quite neglectful of his son, due to his obsession with his constant pursuit of knowledge and power. Despite the uniqueness of his work, Dr. Sid is quite a typical workaholic putting his family life on hold to further his ambitions. He is, nevertheless, not totally without affection for his son, since he had all intentions of one day letting him share in his ambitions and take his rightful place beside him. When you neglect your child in favor of work, however, you shouldn't be all that surprised when your child turns to a life of piracy, or in more general terms, refuses to fit the mold you have created for it. Rad Dad Number 3 Braska from Final Fantasy X just like Barrett, Braska is out to save the world, but unlike Barrett, the threat he and the world faces is more tangible, Sin being a constant threat to the population of Spira as opposed to Shinra's energy manufacturing, hypothetically, according to Aulin's propaganda, killing the planet one day. In addition to this, Braska is able to keep Yuna safe while he is away, firstly by leaving her behind in the holy city of Bevel, and secondly by sending her to Bisei to enjoy a peaceful life as a part of the hard-won calm he has claimed for all the people of Spira. Compared to his daughter, Braska may not have had the same lasting effect, but he did the best he could with what he had and laid the groundwork for her to go even further than he himself did. Bad Dad Number 2 Hojo from Final Fantasy VII Just like Dr. Sid from Final Fantasy XII, Hojo is obsessed with his work although he takes the mad scientist archetype a step further, referring to people as test subjects and wearing a white coat everywhere he goes, even to the beach. It is therefore no surprise that when it came to fathering a child, his desire was only fueled by his thirst for knowledge. From his perspective as a father, the child he sires is predominantly, if not exclusively, an extension of his ambitions. The one time he stands up for his son, he claims it's because of their bond, 
but in doing so he fails to reprimand his child for its reprehensible behavior, thereby failing his duty as a father to properly educate his offspring about right and wrong and enabling it to do great harm. Rat at number 2, King Rhesus from Final Fantasy XV. Rhesus doesn't actually get a lot of screen time in Final Fantasy XV, since almost as soon as Noctis and the guys leave Insomnia, the royal capital is invaded by the Niplheim Empire and the king killed in the process. Even looking at their supplementary film Kingslayer Final Fantasy XV, there is little mention of their father and son relationship since Noctis only makes an appearance in a short post credit scene. What little we do get to see of their relationship can be found in the game A King's Tale, where Regis recounts his earlier adventures to Noctis in the guise of a bedtime story, indicating that Regis has strived to spend some quality time with his son. Another scene I feel is worth mentioning, however, isn't even canon, since it only appeared in the announcement trailer for the game back in 2013. In this scene, Regis teaches Noctis to eat his food, even though he doesn't like how it tastes. But the lesson isn't just about not being a picky eater, but also about respecting the chef and by extension, the people they not only rule over, but also serve. In the game itself, Regis sends his son away to keep him safe, but his intent is not to coddle him. His last words to him, telling him to walk tall, showing the great expectations Regis has towards his son, believing him to be able to take responsibility and to shoulder the weight of the world. Bad Dad Number 1 Gao's Father from Final Fantasy VI Although not a major character, Gao's father is emblematic of perhaps the greatest sin a parent can commit. That is to say, denying the existence of that child. When Gao was born, his mother died in childbirth, causing his father so much grief and trauma that he abandoned the newborn child on the Veldt, a monster-infested plain where monsters from all regions of the world gather. The Japanese name being Kemonogahara, meaning Beast Plains. So yeah, clearly not a place fit for an infant to be left to fend for itself. Aside from leaving Gao for dead that one time, the case could be made that Gao was actually better off not having the kind of man that would do such a thing in his life. But a part of being a good parent is actually rising to the challenge and protecting a child that can't protect itself, not only from dangers of the world, but also from the tragedies of life, at least to the extent that not doing so would seriously endanger the child and its development. Failing to do so not only makes you a bad parent, but rather unfit to be one. Sorry to hear about your wife dying and all, but this isn't about you. Rad Dad Number 1 Saz from Final Fantasy XIII Saz has suffered his fair share of hardships, not only losing his wife three years before the start of the game, leaving him a single parent, but also getting caught up in a government sanctioned purge and subsequently being made the servant of a hostile demigod against his will. It's a long story. Well, maybe not that long. But in the face of all that, Saz remains a devoted father to his son Daj, as all the problems of the world take second place to his needs. Not that Saz is actually there to fulfill those needs for most of the game, but unlike some other characters, leaving his child behind to save the world is not a choice he makes, but rather a destiny imposed upon him that he cannot escape. Saving the world by going to hell and back, only being a stepping stone on the way to being there for his son. Hello everyone, this is Nukwe from Birds of Play, and welcome to the first episode of Top 5 Final Fantasy, a series dedicated to ranking things from the Final Fantasy series. In this video, we're going to be discussing some good old Final Fantasy villains, but not our favorite villains, or the best villains. Rather, we will be discussing the top 5 sympathetic villains from Final Fantasy, and ranking them in order from least sympathetic to most sympathetic. These are of course just my personal musings on the matter, but the two criteria that I had in the back of my mind whilst compiling this list is firstly to what extent we can be expected to feel pity or sorrow for some of these characters, and secondly to what degree we can be expected to find common ground with their intentions and motivations. If you end up liking the video, don't forget to subscribe to the channel, and if you have an idea for a top 5 list that might help us engage in interesting ways with Final Fantasy games, don't forget to leave us a comment down below. But without further ado, let us show some sympathy for the devil. Number 5. Simo Guaro from Final Fantasy X At first glance, and even from the moment he first glances at the player's party, it's hard to imagine Simo as someone we could find common ground with. As a maester of Yevon, he is greatly admired by the people of Spira, 
but we are taught very early on to be wary of his advances and that his compassionate demeanor might mask an ulterior and more sinister motive. We later learn, however, that Seymour has had to suffer his fair share of hardships that might explain his nihilistic worldview. Just like Yuna, Seymour is of mixed heritage, his father being a Guaro and his mother human. But unlike Yuna, he can't pass for a human, leading to a rather traumatic childhood characterized by segregation that leads to the unnecessary and unwanted death of his mother for his own sake. Much of Seymour's malice seems to stem from the trauma he suffered in childhood, and as such, we can sympathize with his character to some degree. There is, however, another commonality to be found between Seymour and Yuna, in that both of them have undertaken the quest to alleviate the pain and suffering of Spira, even though their methods can be said to differ significantly, Seymour's ultimate goal being to extinguish all life. To accomplish his goal, Seymour is prepared to kill anyone that stands in his way, rationalizing that by ending their life, he is in fact freeing them from the pain of existence. On the surface, this sounds like the rationalization of a mass murderer, and it very well might be. Considering Final Fantasy X's heavy Buddhist connotations, however, we might be able to sympathize with Seymour on the grounds that his ambitions have a certain morbid logic to them, as he regards himself as a self-appointed herald of a forceful ejection out of the endless cycle of death and rebirth and the suffering associated with it. For the uninitiated, it's a bit difficult to wrap one's head around Seymour's reasoning, since it requires an understanding or an affinity for Buddhist thought, as well as a certain level of creativity in order to warp these teachings into something so disquieting. Being of such an esoteric nature, it's difficult to sympathize with Seymour's cause, since even though his rationale might not ring completely hollow, it demands that we perform some mental gymnastics to make sense of what might just as well be explained by the world turning its back on him as a child. Number 4. Kuja from Final Fantasy IX Kuja makes this list not on account of having a particularly tragic backstory, even though his upbringing was anything but normal, but rather by virtue of the relatability of the predicament he faces. Kuja's character raises some profound questions about the nature of existence, his original struggle being to free himself from the purpose that was imposed upon him upon birth, but in doing so he is made aware of his own mortality. Kuja is therefore tasked with finding a meaning to life in a world both devoid of purpose and wherein life is finite. Operating behind the scenes, fostering wars between the people of Gaia, he plays his part as the angel of death to the best of his abilities, even though he is secretly plotting to overthrow his master, thereby securing his own independence. Kuja is fundamentally narcissistic, only thinking of himself and his own interests. Despite his age and occupation as a sadistic warmonger, however, Kuja is a child at heart, his cruelty being that of someone who hasn't yet learned to put the needs of others above his own. Make no mistake, Kuja's actions are deplorable, maybe even unforgivable, but he nevertheless stands out as a character and is perhaps not wholly unredeemable, if only someone were there to show him the way. Number 3. Arden Isunia from Final Fantasy XV Much like Kuja, Arden is more than prepared to watch the world burn if it means getting what he wants. Unlike Kuja, however, Arden wishes for nothing more than the sweet embrace of death. So if Arden's methods are unsympathetic like Kuja's and his desire for death somewhat similar to Seymour's, why is it that he ranks higher than both of them on this list? The reason is that even though all of them have their own crosses to bear, Arden takes this to a whole new level by having an almost Christ-like backstory, all of his sacrifices not only going unrewarded, but instead actually punished. Arden's fall from grace is therefore the tragic tale of the archetypical figure of benevolence betrayed, in his case by the very powers he believed he served. Arden's altruistic past makes his descent into madness all the more tragic, and his unimaginably long lifespan, coupled with the immense suffering and the betrayal he has had to endure, puts his wish for death into some much needed context, as something we might actually want to give the benefit of the doubt. After all, we couldn't possibly stand in his shoes. No matter how tragic the tale of Art in Asunia actually is, however, it can't be said to fully justify his actions, even though it might go a long way towards explaining them. In a world that wouldn't see Arden's original self subjected to such cruelty, he would no doubt be the most deserving of our sympathy, both in regard to his character and his cause, although in all fairness, that would probably also disqualify him as a villain. 
Ultimately, as Arden's saint-like self becomes compromised and his initial mission gets corrupted beyond all recognition, we are invited to mourn the passing of a great man while at the same time unabashedly and without reservation condemning what he has become. Number 2. Bane Solidor from Final Fantasy XII When I first started compiling this list, I was sure that Wayne would occupy the top seat. After all, it wouldn't be the first throne he's stolen. My sympathy for Wayne, a ruthless and manipulative tyrant that stops at nothing to achieve his goals, however, might just be an indication that I myself am some sort of Machiavellian megalomaniac, or at least one of their sympathizers. There's just something about characters that are willing to become monsters for what they perceive to be the greater good that really resonates with me. Therefore, Wayne abusing both king and country in order to carve out a path for all of humanity, even at the cost of his own, is something I will always remember. His love for his younger brother Larsa and his attempts to protect him from the evils of the world also illustrates how Vane is always planting seeds for a brighter tomorrow, one that would belong to a purer generation, untainted by the same fires of war that he has purposefully let engulf his very being. The reason Vane ended up being dethroned is, similar to Srimo Guado, the at least somewhat esoteric nature of his mission. In Vane's case, fighting for the freedom of humanity from mostly unseen influences. And since they are unseen, and the population at large unaware of their interference, we might ask ourselves what purpose Vane's battle actually serves. For the majority, who actually holds the reins of history is mostly a formality, since the decisions being made aren't theirs to begin with. This means that Vane might ultimately just be fighting for the freedom of rulers to rule, as opposed to the freedom of people to live their lives how they see fit. Because even though the broader strokes of history might undoubtedly affect the population at large, it's within the confines of that broader framework wherein personal freedom is truly exercised. Honorable mention, Emmett Selk from Final Fantasy XIV. Before we make our way to the top of the list, Emmett Selk gets an honorable mention as someone who is working towards a noble goal, even though it might not appear that way to the people that stand in the way of his ambitions. For the sake of the greater good, however, Emmett Selk has shown that he is at least willing to find common ground with his enemies and strive for peace, although such treaties must always be based on how they might bring him closer to fulfilling his mission. For the people in the know, Emmett Selk brings some much welcome grey area to the events of the game, explaining the motives behind an apparent evil in a compelling way. And for those of you that are still strangers to his exploits, it might be time to give Final Fantasy XIV a try. Number 1. Caius Ballad from Final Fantasy XIII 2. Caius is different from the others on this list, in the sense that he's not actually a real villain, but rather a hero by a different name, fighting to save a loved one from a fate that he perceives as worse than death, as opposed to spending his energies plotting how to destroy the world. Well, to be fair, his plan does entail quite a bit of destroying the world, or at least the natural order of it. But having actually borne witness to the end times himself, hastening the process a little bit doesn't seem like it would be too much of an imposition. After all, what's a few centuries between friends, right? As a reluctant immortal, Caius has been tasked with protecting the Sirius Yule, a young girl that in stark contrast with himself is cursed with an unnaturally short lifespan due to her powers of premonition. Each temporal anomaly caused by the player's party, forcing Yule to have a vision of an altered future thereby shortening her life even further. This means that in our efforts to tip the tides of fate in our own favor, there is someone else out there paying the price for our good fortune. In this sense, it's not all that surprising that Caius feels the need to push back. Because unlike what we often like to tell kids, sometimes it does matter who started it. Being the source of much of Caius' misfortune, as he's destined to observe his precious pledge withered away at a tearfully young age each time she gets reincarnated, we can't help but feel at least a little bit sympathetic towards this misguided champion, whose greatest sin is shouldering the burdens of the world and being too quick to presume what is best for others. Hello everyone, I'm Nakwe from Birds of Play, and in this video we are going to be celebrating Final Fantasy by ranking the top 5 battle systems from the series. While making this list, I did my best to disassociate the battle systems themselves from how I feel about the respective games that they belong to, and in the process I even surprised myself a bit. 
with a list that looks somewhat different from what a list of my actual favorite Final Fantasy games might look like, which is surprising in the sense that the battles are perhaps arguably the most recognizable gameplay component of each game, aside from just running around and, and talking to people. If you love Final Fantasy and want more Final Fantasy content in your life, don't forget to subscribe to the channel if you haven't already, like the video, click the bell, and if you have an idea for a future top 5 Final Fantasy list, tell us in a comment down below. But without further ado, let the battle begin. Number 5. Real-Time Battle from Final Fantasy XIV Originally introduced in Final Fantasy XI, the real-time battle system had players engaging monsters seamlessly out in the field, making it both the first Final Fantasy game without random encounters and the first Final Fantasy game where the environment itself truly became the battlefield. This allowed players to move around freely during battles, interact with other players, as well as to manually run away, just like we would in real life when faced with this. To be honest, I only played Final Fantasy XI for a few hours back in the day, so I can't really claim to be an expert on it, but I think it's safe to say that the combat in Final Fantasy XIV presents an evolved form of the real-time battle system for the better, or at least it's an educated guess of mine. I really should give XI another shot though, but anyway. The combat in Final Fantasy XIV might be quite slow at first, but it does get progressively better as you unlock new skills and more interesting enemies to fight. It's true that even at the higher levels, not every encounter is designed to bring out the best the system has to offer, but taking down a challenging boss along with a group of other players makes for some really good times, even when the group has to gradually come together by trial and error until you finally manage to defeat the boss. Or maybe it's those times especially that are memorable, because it's one thing not to give up by yourself, and a totally different thing to persevere along with a group of people that have chosen to have faith in one another, even though they are total strangers. Final Fantasy XIV's real-time battle system is action-packed, and thanks to the job system, it also has quite a bit of variety, earning it a spot on this list. So do we have any healers in the house? Leave a comment telling us your main class below. Number 4. Command Synergy Battle from Final Fantasy XIII 2 Just like with the real-time battle system from Final Fantasy XIV, our introduction to the Command Synergy Battle System in Final Fantasy XIII isn't necessarily the best. For one thing, you only start off with a very limited selection of abilities, and to make matters worse, the game holds your hand for way too long before you actually get to the good stuff. A lot of people also take issue with the fact that you only control the party leader, instead of the entire party, and that the system is basically automatic, since it actually decides for you which skills are best to use at any given time. You can manually pick which actions to perform, but in most cases it's fairly counterproductive and you're better off just sticking to the recipe. Once you unlock more roles, however, the system finally starts to come into its own as you start to realize that the real strategy isn't about picking which actions to perform, but rather which roles or paradigms to choose for any given situation. But even though the system starts to gain some momentum in Final Fantasy XIII, it isn't until Final Fantasy XIII II that it really starts to hit its stride, with faster paced and more reactive combat, not to mention less hand-holding. In a way it's a shame the Command Synergy battle system didn't make its return in Lightning Returns, featuring even more improvements because the system still feels like it might have some untapped potential. Out of all the Final Fantasy battle systems, the Command Synergy battle system is probably the most streamlined, cutting out all the fluff and the excess fat by discarding useless or seldom used abilities in favor of a sleek and sexy battle system where every action counts. Number 3. Conditional Turn-Based Battle from Final Fantasy X Final Fantasy X's combat system is different from completely turn-based systems in the sense that it doesn't operate in rounds, but rather the participants are listed in order depending on factors such as their speed and which actions they perform. Also, unlike every Final Fantasy game since Final Fantasy IV, the combat in Final Fantasy X is an active turn-based combat, meaning that you can take all the time you want to make decisions about which actions to take. I actually got so used to this system that once I finally got my hands on Final Fantasy IX a year later, I just casually stood up and went to the bathroom without pausing 
which resulted in a particularly painful game over, since I had made it all the way to the ice cavern to fight Black Walls number one and the sea lion, and for some reason I had never bothered to save the game, meaning that I lost all my progress and had to start all over again at the beginning. But anyway, enough about my pain. Another thing that makes Final Fantasy X's battle system unique is the ability to switch out party members, letting everyone join in the fun. Although switching party members to make sure everyone gets a turn in order to get experience points can be a bit of a drag. And when I say a bit, I am being kind. Nevertheless, this is probably my favorite battle system, but I hesitate to put it at the top for a number of reasons. The first being that it isn't particularly innovative. In some ways it actually feels like a devolution of the active time battle system as opposed to an evolution. To be fair, not every system needs to invent the wheel, but there is something to be said for the artistry involved in systems such as the command synergy battle system from Final Fantasy XIII and XIII 2. Another reason is that Final Fantasy X doesn't really explore the implications of its system in any meaningful way. Sure, you can cast haste and do some stuff to affect the turn order, but it's not really an integral part of the experience. And now that I've poisoned my tongue by being critical of Final Fantasy X, I feel like I must lie down for a second. And I'm back. Number 2. Active Time Battle from Final Fantasy X 2. The Active Time Battle System, or ATB, was introduced in Final Fantasy IV back in 1991 and was the first battle system to receive a dedicated name. But even though Final Fantasy IV was the first game to feature the ATB system, the ATB gauge actually didn't make an appearance until Final Fantasy V a year later. The system was then used for every Final Fantasy game up until Final Fantasy X. The major difference that made each manifestation of it unique being how it interacted with other systems in each game, such as the job system in Final Fantasy V, the material system from Final Fantasy VII, and the junction system from Final Fantasy VIII. The system then returned in a somewhat modified version in Final Fantasy X II, a universally beloved classic that is often considered the best Final Fantasy has to offer. Or maybe not so universally beloved, a good game nonetheless. But just like Final Fantasy XIII II has been celebrated for its combat despite other criticism, Final Fantasy X II has also been recognized for its excellent battle system due to it having spiced up the traditional ATP system with stuff like chaining attacks, as well as having the battle positions changing dynamically mid-battle. Being able to change between dress fees, the game's version of job classes, in the middle of battle is also a welcome addition, one that allows for more flexibility than other job systems. All in all, it's a fluid and action-oriented take on the turn-based formula that left me wanting more, a lot of people might be on the fence about whether they would want a further continuation of Final Fantasy X's story, but I at least always believed that Final Fantasy X's 2 evolution of the classic ATP system deserved to be developed further. But with turn-based combat having fallen out of favor today, such a development represents the road not taken, and knowing how way leads on to way, such promises may well have been forsaken. Number 1 Active Battle from Final Fantasy VII Remake Unlike other battle systems in this video, the battle system in Final Fantasy VII Remake doesn't have a dedicated name, although it does take inspiration from the ATB system by featuring a version of the ATB gauge. The big difference is that the combat is in real time, just like it was in Final Fantasy XV's Active Axe battle system. Out of these two active battle systems, however, I think the battle system in Final Fantasy VII Remake feels a lot more polished and varied, and less easy to break. Not to mention that the slow motion effect when you are choosing abilities just looks mind-blowingly good every time. That being said, the combat system is not without its faults, the biggest issue for a lot of people being the aerial combat. With the release of episode intermission, however, the future looks promising since Yuffie seems to have a handle on the aerial combat side of things, something that will hopefully rub off onto her future teammates once he presumably steals their materia, making them the best of friends. But why is Final Fantasy VII Remake at the top of this list if I'm such a fan of turn-based combat? Well, in all honesty, I would love to see a mainline Final Fantasy game going back to the ATP system, like I mentioned earlier, going even further with the changes implemented by Final Fantasy X 2, really putting the action into the turn-based formula. 
But since turn-based has fallen out of favor, Final Fantasy VII Remake currently represents both the most ambitious combat system in the series, as well as the most impressive one. I'm not saying that the new is always better than the old, but in this case, I feel like I must give the devil his due, even though it makes my turn-based loving heart ache a little. Thankfully, Final Fantasy VII Remake's combat more than makes up for it, and it's not like I can't just keep playing the older games to get my turn-based fix. Hello everyone, I'm Nakwe. And I'm Peter. And we are the Birds of Play. In this video, we are going to be celebrating one of the staples of Final Fantasy by ranking the top five sexy Sith characters from the series. As two heterosexual white males, we feel like we are uniquely qualified to answer which old white dude makes the people weak in the knees. So strap in for a sexual exploration of the only true fantasy daddies of the sky. Who wouldn't want to take a ride in their airship, am I right? I sure am curious about riding one. It's definitely something I haven't experienced before. Incidentally, an airship is a great example of a phallic symbol, and I'm sure we'll find many more examples of those. Totally. Anyway, if you end up liking the video, and who wouldn't, it's about sexy sits, please consider subscribing to the channel to become a part of our sexy avian-themed Final Fantasy family. But without further ado, let's, let's get, get confused. Sexy Sid number 5. Sid reigns from Final Fantasy 13. For some, this generic pretty boy might be the only Sid to truly be considered sexy. After all, he's the only one who meets the sort of standard criteria for beauty, especially in East Asia. However, the only reason we're even mentioning this guy is to establish a baseline. And so that you don't watch this entire video thinking, I wonder when Sid Reigns is going to show up, because of that I say grow up. As someone who isn't blessed with an abundance of chest hair myself, let me tell you, I like a man with some chest hair, meaning a man who carries his scars proudly. Sid Reigns might be damaged on the inside, but the beast within is too well hidden, too well concealed. But once he lets it out, rawr, I wouldn't mind being his focus. Sexy Sid number four. Sid from Final Fantasy X. Yar, matey. Here's a man in uniform who has his own ship, a crew that would follow him to the grave, and a kick-ass head tattoo. Sid is the perfect example of a hard-shell daddy with a soft, creamy center. His tough, leathery exterior, betrayed by his compassionate demeanor, not to mention the word love, tattooed on the side of a shiny, masculine head. Now there's a man who can do it all. This captain could spend its nights serenading you with Albert, the language of love, but he won't, because he's too busy being a natural-born leader, fighting against the man, using the power of science and machines in his crusade against organized religion. Mujawi, sir. Mujawi. Sexy Sid number 3, Sid Kramer from Final Fantasy VIII. Many might initially overlook Sid Kramer's inherent sexiness, but that's because they forget that he's sexy in a certain context. As an educator, Sid is an authority figure, and authority can be very sexy. Hey, I get what you're saying. Sid Kramer definitely isn't the only Sid in a position of authority, and that's totally true. However, he isn't just an authority figure, but rather an authority figure to a bunch of young people, many of whom still haven't developed the proper self-awareness to resist the allure of authority. And since there doesn't seem to be an overabundance of other prospective male role models at Balam Garden, aside from perhaps Norg with his huge sexy hands and phallic looking fingers, the context in which Sid is sexy becomes even more pronounced. He being the only mature male eye candy that isn't kept locked in the basement. Sid practically winning sexiest man on campus by default. Plant your seeds, Sid. Plant your seeds in me. <laughs> Sexy Sid number two. Sid Highwind from Final Fantasy VII. Hey, did your dad ever yell at you? Mine sure did. Did your dad ever blow smoke in your face and berate you for not being good enough? 
mine sure did. If you're into that shit, then have I got the man for you. His name is Sid Highwind, and he first appeared in a little-known gem named Final Fantasy VII. This cigarette-smelling 32-year-old has got a chip on his shoulder, and it's up to you to help him get over it. Sid carries a spear into battle, which you'd be forgiven for mistaking as a phallic symbol, meant to compensate for something he's lacking. But you'd be wrong, because Sid leaves the job of a phallic symbol to his mighty, girthy rocket ship, standing proud and erect at the outskirts of Rocket Town. It's considerable base, surrounded by dense bushes and trees that could surely use a trim, and its shaft tilted at a slight angle towards the infinite sky. This certainly is one rocket ship I'd like to ride and see what all the fuss is about. Honorable Mentions Sid Del Norte Marquis from Final Fantasy VI the man is a walking phallic symbol, dressed from head to toe like the most luxurious condom a fantasy world could ever conjure up. It's even pixelated for your pleasure. As a modest sprite, Final Fantasy VI's Sid might leave a lot to the imagination, but that's kind of the point. There's nothing as sexy as what you can imagine. And just imagine taking care of him when he gets sick feeding him an assortment of raw fish to nurse him back to health. It's a romance novel that practically writes itself, putting you in the role of caretaker, his life in your hands. You, you can save him. Sexy Sid number one. Sid Garland from Final Fantasy XIV. Do you like men who are good with their hands? What about men who run their own successful engineering company? What about a guy that takes care of his body, stays in shape, even when the world around him seems to be on the brink of collapse? Then look no further, because Sid, forehead G-spot Garland, is all you'll ever need. His strong, weathered hands, yet surprisingly gentle, will make sure you feel safe, protected, and satisfied. On the topic of satisfaction, Sid is no stranger to gadgets and toys. You can be sure he has an ace or two up his sleeves when it comes to using them. This silver fox has had quite the life, defecting from his homeland to stay true to his principles, surviving a literal moon to the face. Just imagine what else he could take full force to the face. What a man. What a Sid. Welcome to Top 5 Final Fantasy. I'm Nafke from Birds of Play, and in this video, we're going to be ranking the top 5 opening cinematics from the Final Fantasy series. Usually, one of the problems with ranking all things Final Fantasy is that the series consists of a large number of games that have been released over a long period of time, meaning that it's not reasonable to expect that everyone has played every single entry in the series. This is why the topic of this video is so ingenious, because no matter which Final Fantasy game you've played or haven't played, we're only going to be discussing the beginning of each title. And who knows, maybe you'll be inspired to play a game you haven't played before, or more likely, restart a game that you've been playing on and off for the last 20 plus years. Don't worry, I'm not here to judge you, I'm just here to judge the opening cinematics. If you end up liking the video, don't forget to subscribe to the channel if you haven't already, and join the birdhouse, becoming a part of our growing Final Fantasy family. Also, if you have an idea for some other interesting top 5 topics, that might help us engage with Final Fantasy in novel and interesting ways, don't forget to leave us a comment down below. We would love to make your suggestions a reality. But now, without further ado, let us raise the curtain on the top 5 opening cinematics from the Final Fantasy series. Number 5. Final Fantasy VI The Final Fantasy franchise has always had a flair for the cinematic, even before the games featured pre-rendered cutscenes. Regardless of technical limitations, however, the opening cinematic of Final Fantasy VI, wherein three sets of Magitek armor can be seen marching through the snow, manages to do very much with very little, creating an iconic and atmospheric scene simply by using the overworld map as a basis. Although this scene doesn't have any wide-reaching implications for the game as a whole, it sets the tone for the game's opening and uses cinematic techniques to tell the player that Final Fantasy VI is a game worth taking seriously. Number 4. Final Fantasy XII 
6 plus 6 might equal 12, but the opening cinematic of Final Fantasy XII has very little in common with the opening of Final Fantasy VI. Aside from Final Fantasy XI, Final Fantasy XII was the first game to feature an opening cinematic with spoken dialogue. However, just like in the case of film history, as film left the silent era and tackled a brave new world of sound, the introduction of spoken dialogue can be said to have been a little bit of a double-edged sword. For one thing, the spoken delivery of information often comes to the cost of visual intrigue and visual storytelling. Thankfully, in the case of Final Fantasy XII, the opening manages to strike a good balance between showing and telling by keeping the dialogue to a minimum. This gives the game an opportunity to show Final Fantasy's love for the Star Wars series by recreating familiar scenes from the Phantom Menace within the world of Ivalis. Just kidding, or am I? More importantly, however, it sets up the historical backdrop for the game in a matter of minutes and hints at a level of political depth that has been mostly absent from the series. This game is going to be different from the Final Fantasy games that came before it and is not afraid of telling us. Number 3. Final Fantasy VII Final Fantasy VII's opening cinematic is as iconic as they come, making use of the capabilities of the new PlayStation hardware in order to deliver a pre-rendered cinematic unlike anything the series had offered before. In the first few seconds, the opening serves as a microcosm of the game's major environmental themes by having us consider the interconnectedness between the cosmos itself, the planet, and last but not least, the human element of it all with Aerith's face emerging from the darkness that the light from the stars and the planet's life stream couldn't fully illuminate. As if that wasn't iconic enough, we are then treated to the digital camera accomplishing one of the most impressive zoom shots in the history of cinema, as we move all the way from a dark alleyway into a wide shot that encompasses the entire city. And what a city it is! But as instantly iconic as the city of Midgar is, the cityscape is as dystopian as it is sublime hinting at the fact that something must be done, and maybe we are the person to do it. Finally, we see a train arriving at its destination, where the pre-rendered cinematic merges seamlessly with the in-game graphics, or you know, almost seamlessly. Regardless of such minor technical hiccups, however, the opening cinematic of Final Fantasy VII remains an important milestone not only for the Final Fantasy series, but also for the trust placed in video games as a medium for storytelling. Number 2 Final Fantasy X For many players, watching Final Fantasy X's opening cinematic was the moment the sophistication of the computer-generated imagery on display caught up with their dreams. It might not be on par with the best graphics have to offer nowadays or what they will be capable of in the future, but it nevertheless represents a significant step forward for the series in regard to realistic renditions of people and places. Just look at that water! Just look at Tidus! Just look at Tidus in the water! Just look at Tidus out of the water. Just look at Auron standing at the top of a tall building, raising a toast to what appears to be an incoming tidal wave, in a shot that is as cool as it is packed with hidden meaning. As an introduction to the game, the scene introduces us to Tidus not only at home in the water, but also at home in a futuristic metropolis wherein he has made a name for himself as a star blitzball player. As the scene progresses, however, we see how his world crumbles before his very eyes which seems fitting in a way, since as a stranger in the foreign land of Spira, Tidus' worldview repeatedly gets challenged as he is forced to find out that things don't work like they did back home. Honorable mentions, Final Fantasy. You you know you know the f the first one. Honorable mentions this time around go to the Heroes on the Hill from the original Final Fantasy, a still image that is little more than a delayed title card with some exposition and credits for the game. It might not look like much, but it's notable for at least two reasons. Firstly, displaying the title card and the credits after some time has already passed is a recognizably cinematic technique, signaling to the player, just like so many openings that followed in its wake, that this wasn't just any other game. Secondly, featuring the credits so prominently drew attention to the creators themselves, telling the player that this was a game artistically crafted as opposed to simply being soullessly produced. Since then, decades have passed, but the initial promise set forth in the original Final Fantasy has been made good on time and time again, making the cinematic an integral part of the Final Fantasy experience and something the franchise continues to be celebrated for to this day. Number 1. Final Fantasy VIII 
After the success of Final Fantasy VII, Final Fantasy VIII had some big shoes to fill. Luckily, the developers of Final Fantasy had learned a lot from their first foray into the world of 3D, and now it was time to start capitalizing on it by making one of the most captivating opening cinematics in the history of video games. Say what you will about the game itself, the opening of Final Fantasy VIII featured stunning visuals and a superb musical score that elicited an emotional reaction and a sense of awe that wasn't commonly attributed to video games at the time. The opening scene plays a little bit like a music video or an advertisement for the game, with seemingly random scenes jumbled together, yet ultimately converging on two figures locking blades. The true meaning of the opening isn't revealed until a lot later in the game, so upon first viewing, the mystery of it all might come across as somewhat nonsensical, or simply as a spectacle for the sake of spectacle. However, even devoid of its ulterior meaning, the scene even holds up as a pure spectacle, by having some of Nobuo Uematsu's best work as a composer accompanying some of the most revolutionary visuals of the time. Then, once you're made aware of the significance of the opening, the scene takes on yet another meaning, making for a perfect beginning to a game some fans would be playing again and again, maybe even for the rest of their lives. Welcome to Top 5 Final Fantasy. I'm Nökwe from Birds of Play, and in this video, we're going to be celebrating a common trope in Final Fantasy games, or at least common enough to make a list about it. The trope being prison escapes. In one way or another, Final Fantasy characters seem to have a habit of finding themselves behind bars, and subsequently having to break themselves out. After all, the world isn't going to save itself. As a teacher, I can sympathize with the feeling of being trapped, especially now at the end of the semester, when stacks of papers to grade have become the bars of my prison. But I can also appreciate the sense of freedom that accompanies a successful prison break, just like it accompanies the promises of summer break. See what I did there? If you end up liking the video, or if you like freedom, summer, and most importantly Final Fantasy, don't forget to subscribe to the channel and join the birdhouse, becoming a part of our growing Final Fantasy family. But without further ado, it's time to break free. I want to break free! Number 5. Via Purifico from Final Fantasy X. Upon finding themselves in trouble with the Church of Yevon, Yuna and her party get thrown down into the Via Purifico, a dungeon located underneath the holy city of Bevel, where prisoners are expected to roam the hallways of the labyrinth till their last breath. Effectively a death sentence, those sentenced to the Via Purifico are not expected to return, although the name does imply that those that might return would then have their sins abolished. Via Purifico meaning road to purification in Latin, and the Japanese name Juosai no Michi, similarly meaning the road of the cleansing of sin. No, not that sin. It's the sin of disobeying Yevanya. However, upon re-emerging from the dungeon, against all odds and with their lives still intact, there is no forgiveness to be found. Maybe the Church of Yevon is as bad at following its own teachings as it is picking witch prisoners to drown. You know, because they only send the people that can actually function underwater into the sewers? It's not a joke if you have to explain it, brother. Well, regardless of my apparently failed attempt at humor, the Via Purifico is notable for being the only part in the game where the player gets to control someone other than Tyrus outside of battle. As a dungeon, the Via Purifico might not be the best time you'll have playing Final Fantasy X, but for better or worse, it offers a new experience as the party you have come to rely on gets split up, adding a new layer of challenge to the experience and driving the point home that even though Yuna herself is quite capable, Having her guardians around is an irreplaceable part of the journey. All of them making it out of the inescapable dungeon, also driving the point home that this is the group that will go on to accomplish what has never been done before. Say what you will about Seymour, but at least he had faith that they'd make it out alive. Number 4. Nalbina Fortress from Final Fantasy XII Although not a proper prison, Van, Balthier and Fran are thrown into the Nalbina dungeons, adapted from the lower floors of the once great Nalbina Fortress. Unlike the Via Purifico, there is quite a bit more company to be found in Nalbina, as the inmates are seemingly allowed to roam freely around the complex, violence being a common form of socialization. When Van gets attacked by a group of Sikh, Balthier gets a chance to chime in and show not only a little bit more of his cool and composed side, but also his compassionate and perhaps even righteous personality as he is unwilling to leave Van to his fate, 
even though he has only known him for a brief while. After recovering their weapons, the escape then becomes pretty much standard fare as the party is invited to fight its way out, but on the way they encounter Bash, chained up and literally left hanging. Contrary to Balthier, Van takes this as a chance to absolutely lose his shit and jump onto the cage like a monkey, the noise alerting the guards, leaving Fran no choice but to drop the cage, prompting them to make their escape. As prison escapes go, it's fairly convincing or plausible since Nalpina Fortress isn't actually a fully functional prison facility, meaning that it's likely to have all sorts of nooks and crannies that might be taken advantage of. However, the probability of all of them surviving the drop is another matter entirely. Number 3, Alexandria Castle from Final Fantasy IX. After not receiving quite the welcome he had hoped for, Steiner finds himself trapped in a cage along with Marcus, the two of them suspended from the ceiling and hanging high above the ground below. In order to make their escape, the unlikely duo is forced not only to cooperate in order for them to make their escape, but also to coordinate. See what I did there? Together, they swing back and forth in unison until the cage crashes into the walls, breaking the bars open in the process. What follows is a continual stream of Alexandrian soldiers arriving on the scene, only to be beaten back by the two of them. For those interested, this is a prime opportunity for grinding, especially if you have acquired the Blood Sword that lets you absorb the life energy of your enemies. Equipping it to either Steiner or Marcus allows them to fight the endless stream of enemies indefinitely, even maxing out their level. Marcus's stat boosts then being transferred to Aiko when she joins the party. The only cost behind this method being the time it takes and the innumerable lives of Alexandrian soldiers it requires. Regardless of whether you opt to go on a killing spree or not, this particular prison break signifies a major turning point for Steiner's character, as his accumulative doubts finally manifest through action as he displays admirably and in the face of much adversity where his true loyalty lies. This is therefore a pretty meaningful escape, not to mention that the swinging back and forth thing is pretty fun. Number 2. D District Prison from Final Fantasy VIII After a failed assassination attempt, the party finds itself imprisoned with her weapons confiscated. For Rinoa, escaping the prison is easy enough as he gets picked up and escorted off the premises on her father's orders. The rest of the party, however, has to come up with its own plan to get out. The D District Prison Escape is probably the most classic take on a prison escape in the Final Fantasy series, but maybe it's as insane as it is classic. Cell starts by luring the guard in by telling him that Quistis and Selfie have been bitten by a snake, and like any professionally trained guard, he of course comes into the room alone to check on them only to get knocked out by Cell. Cell then exits the cell, see what I did there, and goes to get their weapons, which are conveniently lying around on the next floor. And once everyone is armed, the prison's magic jammer is disabled by the security system itself, allowing the party to use their full abilities. Seeing as this is a very iconic prison escape, one would be forgiven for thinking it would be at the top of the list, but it's somewhat weighed down by the sheer amount of running up and down that's required, the floors essentially being copied assets with minimal alterations. But most of all, it's dragged down by that damn divider thingy that forces you to run an entire lap around the entire floor instead of just going straight to the next staircase. Just jump over it, god damn it. Also, bring Moombas back. Give me more Moombas! Number 1. The Shinra Building from Final Fantasy VII Final Fantasy VII loves its prisons. There's a prison underneath the gold saucer, where an amusement park has seemingly taken the law into its own hands. There's also some sort of prison facility in Junon, as the party gets detained there later on in the game, but the first jail cell is in the Shinra building itself, back in Midgar. While imprisoned there, the party gets some time for a good heart-to-heart, -heart, after all the hustle and bustle of breaking into the building and scaling its many floors. Unlike the other prison escapes on this list, however, the party doesn't escape on its own, since they awaken to find an open door, allowing them to make a break for it. There is a catch though, since as they make their escape, they come across a mysterious and unsettling trail of blood left by the Genova specimen that was kept nearby. The scene introduces a third dynamic into the fight between Avalanche and Shinra, 
as Cloud and the others seemingly are the only ones that have it in for the Mecha Corporation. Many fans were disappointed that this scene wasn't included in the Final Fantasy VII Remake, but at least we'll always have the original. And do you know the only thing that could have made the original escape even better? That's right, Moombas! Moombas! Give me more Moombas! Give me more Moombas! Give me more Moombas, please! Welcome to Top 5 Final Fantasy. I'm Nokwe from Birds of Play, and in this video, we're going to be celebrating everyone's favorite feathered friends from Final Fantasy by ranking the top 5 Chocobo characters from the series. Like the title of the video suggests, we will mainly be focusing on individual or specific Chocobos and how they contribute to the games they are a part of, instead of looking at which game has the best version of Chocobos. If you end up liking the video, don't forget to subscribe to the channel and join the birdhouse. But without further ado, let us see how these birds of a feather rank together. Number 5. Chocolina from the Final Fantasy XIII Trilogy It might be a bit strange to start off a list of top 5 Chocobo characters with a half-naked woman that is best known for hanging around strange places trying to sell something. But contrary to the picture I just painted of someone who might just as well be a common prostitute, Chocolina is actually a class act. Having been recognized by the goddess Atro, and granted the ability to take human form due to a strong conviction of wanting to aid the heroes on their journey. Originally purchased by Sash as a gift for his son, this little jokeable chick, turned spunky brunette chick with a questionable fashion sense, joins the ranks of traveling merchants such as Stiltskin and Oaka in the Final Fantasy series by crossing both time and space in order to get us what we need. Jokolina might not be everyone's cup of tea, both her attitude and her attire being considered as abrasive by many. But there's no denying that as a chocobo, in one form or another, Chocolina displays a sense of loyalty befitting even the best of birds. Number 4. Bobby Corrin from Final Fantasy IX When two black mages find a curious egg, they take it upon themselves to care for it and protect it from the many dangers of the world, which turn out to be mostly Quinna's insatiable appetite. Once the egg finally hatches, they name the hatchling Bobby Corvin and continue to care for him. Since Bobby is so new to life and the world, however, it might be said that his character is much too underdeveloped to warrant him ranking anywhere on a list such as this one. But even though Bobby can't be said to make his own voice heard, his importance to the people around him is what ultimately defines his character. Bobby being a manifestation of life in its infancy and fragility, reminding us that those of us in a position to help those in need are privileged to be able to take them under our wing, even if our wings are figurative and theirs literal. Number 3. Chichiri from Final Fantasy Type O Chichiri is a chocobo companion of Hisana, and together they share a cruel fate right at the beginning of the game, both of them getting tragically killed in the attack on their home. Before the final curtain call, however, they nevertheless manage to admirably showcase the depth of the bond that can exist between riders and their chocobos by taking turns coming to each other's rescue. Chichiri fending off some soldiers that had Isana cornered, and Isana returning the favor by spending the last of his energy attempting to heal Chichiri, even as he himself can't help but crawl across the battlefield covered in his own blood. Although the tale of their camaraderie might not have a happy ending, and even though this opening scene only presents a brief moment in their life together, their story is not one to be forgotten. Number 2. Boko from Final Fantasy V Boko is the original loyal chocobo, cementing the relationship between riders and their steeds, not only being Bart's chocobo, but also his loyal friend. On a side note, it will be very interesting to see to what extent this kind of relationship will be explored in Final Fantasy XVI in the case of Clive and his silver chocobo, Hopefully the game will make this list somewhat outdated and in need of revision, since chocobos with a specific character are sadly few and far between. In the case of Boko, his loyalty to Bards even outweighs his responsibilities as a father, since he is ready to leave his family at the drop of a hat to rejoin the adventure. Is Boko's willingness to leave his family in order to fulfill his duty to his master inspiring, or is he just a bad father? You decide. Honorable mentions Nameless Chocobos Honorable mentions this time around go to all the nameless chocobos in the series that have helped us along the way without proper recognition, be they big or small, yellow or gold, or anything in between. We're thankful for them all. Number 1. Choco from Final Fantasy IX 
as an unabashed celebration of the first 13 years of Final Fantasy, it's quite fitting that Final Fantasy IX features not only a great chocobo, but also a great chocobo minigame. Choco is as loyal as they come, and Chocobo Hot and Cold is not only rewarding for its own sake, but also serves as a promise of an adventure that spans the entire world of Gaia. This means that Choco is very useful, since keeping up with his adventures can add the party some great gear, but it also means that making the most of him is sure to bring the player a deeper understanding and appreciation of the game world itself. What sets Choco apart from the loyal steed archetype of some other Chocobos, however, is that Choco has hopes and dreams of his own hoping to one day reach the Chocobo's paradise, a realm where Chocobos can live freely. Helping Choco reach his goals is therefore mutually beneficial, and I must say, it's a great change of pace to be able to give something back to our loyal friends, the Chocobos. Welcome to Top 5 Final Fantasy. I'm Nokwe from Birds of Play, and in this video, we're going to be ranking the top 5 guest party members from the Final Fantasy series. When it comes to judging which guest party member will reign supreme, there are at least two criteria to keep in mind. The first being how useful or fun they are to have around in battle, and the second one, how big an impression their addition to the party adds to their character and the story. If you end up liking the video, you might want to consider becoming a regular guest of the channel yourself. So don't forget to subscribe and join the birdhouse. Even if it's only for a little while, you might leave a big impression. And speaking of leaving an impression, don't forget to tell us down in the comments below if you have any wishes for future top 5 Final Fantasy lists, and who knows, we might even make your wish a reality. But without further ado, be our guest as we check out all the rest. Number 5. Core Leonis from Final Fantasy XV In a game about taking a road trip with the guys, while listening to some classic Final Fantasy tunes and looking for a good place to fish, Core represents a much appreciated call back to reality. When Core joins the party, we are reminded of our responsibilities as royalty, for even though Kor's vocation is to serve the crown of Lucis, he seems to have little qualms about speaking truth to power and putting this in a place when needed. Aside from being a general badass wielding a big-ass katana that any king in waiting would be lucky to have around, Kor is a lifeline to the central story of Final Fantasy XV that otherwise often seems to be just out of reach. Therefore, with Kor around, we can take joy in having a man with his abilities on our side, at the same time we take solace in the fact that our naive prince has been set on the path of becoming the king his people need him to be. Number 4. Seymour Guado from Final Fantasy X Seymour only joins the party for a single fight, but he's a very welcome addition to the team, especially since the battle is almost tailor-made for him to show off his abilities, Seymour's powerful spells bypassing the Sinspawn's defenses. In addition to this, Seymour is notable for having access to both black and white magic something other characters will have a hard time emulating until later in the game, especially if you're playing on the standard sphere grid. Just like Sephiroth's guest appearance in Final Fantasy VII, Seymour shows us in action what we ourselves can aspire to one day become. The difference in skill might not be as pronounced as the disparity in skill between the Fletchling Cloud and the veteran Sephiroth, but actually having manual control over Seymour lets us experience firsthand what wielding this power actually feels like as well as teases Seymour as a possible future party member. Even though our paths ultimately diverge due to Seymour having a, let's say, very unique solution to Spiro's problems, our short time together nevertheless underscores a common humanity, even if just for a brief moment and even if Seymour joining the fight was incentivized by ulterior motives. Number 3. Marcus from Final Fantasy IX Number 3 was a toss-up between Beatrix and Marcus from Final Fantasy IX. On the one hand, Beatrix is a fan favorite that a lot of players wanted to see included in the main party. After experiencing firsthand how strong she is by finding ourselves at the wrong end of her blade on more than one occasion, it is also a great change of pace to get a controller in battle, even though she could be said to suffer from a little bit of villain turd ally syndrome. Marcus, on the other hand, has been by our side from the very beginning, and stepped in as the resident thief character in the absence of Sedan. Showing Marcus some love can also benefit the party in the long run, since his stats transfer over to Aiko without affecting her level, making it possible to really beef her up. This coupled with the fact that Marcus is present during the only point in the game that features an endless stream of enemies and can be equipped with a blood sword so that he can heal himself by fighting, makes for a very interesting combination of exploitable elements in the game. Regardless of these more practical concerns, however, 
Marcus gets a spot on this list for being a real bro. Like some lovesick puppy that is finally getting attention, my heart is telling me Beatrix, but my brain is telling me Marcus. Number 2. Larsa Solidor from Final Fantasy XII When it comes to helpful guest characters in the Final Fantasy series, I imagine that a lot of players have fond memories of Larsa, as he joins the party for the first time as they venture into the Lushu Mines in Bujerba. The reason is that Larsa seems to be equipped with an infinite amount of potions to heal the party with, which is particularly important at such an early stage in the game, when the party hasn't yet become completely self-sufficient in regard to healing. Larsa's assistance is made even more important by the fact that the Lushu Mines include one of the best spots for early grinding in the game, in no small part thanks to having Larsa around. I could try to say something profound about how finding alongside Larsa, the younger brother of the game's main antagonist, humanizes the opposition, but when all is said and done, I'm just here for the potions. Honorable mention, Ghosts from Final Fantasy VI. Before we get to the top of the list, honorable mentions go to the Ghosts from Final Fantasy VI, for reminding us that sometimes a little can go a long way. The Ghosts can only be recruited while riding the Phantom Train, and have very limited combat capabilities, aside from diverting damage and sacrificing themselves by possessing monsters. But the sheer novelty of the experience encapsulates perhaps one of the most important aspects of being joined by guests, by giving us a chance to mix things up a little and make the most of every encounter, no matter how transient or fleeting it might be. Number 1. Cypher Almacy from Final Fantasy VIII Unlike some other characters on this list, Cypher doesn't bring any special powers to the table, aside from needing to sustain less damage than the others in order to trigger a potential limit break. Instead, Cypher is just one of the gang, the source of his powers ultimately coming from the same place since he, just like the others, must be equipped with a guardian force and have a magic junction in order to power up. Cypher joins the team very early in the game, at a time when the main party hasn't yet been fully formed, meaning that the player would be forgiven for mistaking him for a permanent party member. As fate would have it, however, Cypher seems destined for other things. No matter how much our paths might be said to diverge, we can nevertheless look back on our time with Cypher and reminisce about the good old times when we fought side by side, killing enemy soldiers in a foreign country for money in order to help our school stay funded and maybe finance some of our extracurricular activities, like riding trains and stuff. By betting on the wrong horse, Cypher represents the flip side of the adventure, as someone we might just as easily have become if only the tables had been turned, fighting alongside him driving the point home that at our core, we aren't all that different. Hello everyone, I'm Nakwe. And I'm Peter. And we are the Birds of Play. In this video, we're going to be celebrating our favorite Final Fantasy games by ranking our, well, top five favorite Final Fantasy games. And since this is going to be a list of our favorite games, we're actually going to be walking through two different rankings. Because, as you may or may not have noticed, we are two different people. And this is a chance to get to know us. Lucky you! If you end up liking the video, please consider subscribing to the channel if you haven't already, and don't forget to tell us about your top 5 favorite Final Fantasy games down in the comments below, so that we can get to know you better. There are no wrong answers. But without further ado, let us tell you about the games we've taken the most liking to. Good one! My favorite Final Fantasy game, number 5. Final Fantasy XIV. It's a bit difficult to compare Final Fantasy XIV to most other Final Fantasy games, since it's so drastically different. But we here at the Birds of Play have been playing Final Fantasy XIV on and off again ever since the release of A Realm Reborn, and thrown quite a bit of time into it. I like Final Fantasy XIV for its focus on telling an epic story in the context of an MMORPG. So if you've been sleeping on the game purely for the sake of it being an MMO, be aware that you are missing out on a rich story worthy of the Final Fantasy name. Not to mention, you can play with friends. Oh, and also, you will feel compelled to place it in your own favorite Final Fantasy ranking just to justify all the time you've poured into it. Just remember, play responsibly. My favorite Final Fantasy game number 5, also Final Fantasy XIV. 
So these rankings are starting out kind of the same, even though you'd think we try to mix things up a bit in favor of making a more interesting video and comparison between the two of us. But we are prioritizing honesty and integrity over entertainment. Please don't leave! But yeah, Final Fantasy XIV gets a spot on my list for its fantastic story and the ability to play with others. But I also want to mention how the game can function as a sort of hub for the Final Fantasy fandom or a place for Final Fantasy fans to enjoy the franchise in between the release of other Final Fantasy titles. For example, we will probably be waiting for Final Fantasy VII Remake Part 2 and Final Fantasy XVI for quite a while, but while we wait, it's great to know that the world of Final Fantasy XIV will always be there waiting with us. And soon it will even take us to the moon! The moon! My favorite Final Fantasy game number 4, Final Fantasy VIII. I know that a lot of people don't really care for Final Fantasy VIII. The junction system for one takes a while to get used to, and the story could be described as convoluted. Not that that's necessarily a bad thing, but love it or hate it, the game was a technological milestone when it came out, both in terms of the in-game graphics and the pre-rendered cinematics. Not that graphics are everything, but back in those days, pushing the boundaries of what was possible in video games was something that really left... <laughs> Was something that. No, era high resonator. No, radio host. Ah, uh, Pushing the boundaries of what was possible in video games was something that really left an impression. So the nostalgia factor is really strong with this one. But the music is timeless and some of the best the series has to offer, past and present. Couple that with a little bit of teenage angst, and you got a real winner. My favorite Final Fantasy game number 4, Final Fantasy 7. I'm guessing that quite a few of you are shocked, maybe even outraged at me for ranking Final Fantasy 7 so low. But I don't really consider it low at all since the game is in such prestigious company. Final Fantasy 7 was my entry into the Final Fantasy series back in the day, and I remember being amazed by the sheer scope of the game. It felt almost infinitely large and explorable, and I was in awe that something like it existed at all let alone that someone had constructed it. It was in a way an artistic reaction or an early visceral reaction to art, and it paved the way for my future appreciation of not only future Final Fantasy games, but also works of art in general. So I guess you could say that even though Final Fantasy VII is my all-time favorite Final Fantasy game, it's still the game through which all subsequent love and appreciation has been filtered. You're so pretentious, brother. I f***ing hate you. Moving on. My favorite Final Fantasy game number 3, Final Fantasy 7. So I rank Final Fantasy 7 a bit higher than you, but still not at the top. Keep on watching to find out the top spots or just skip ahead. Please don't skip ahead. We need those watch hours. But Final Fantasy 7 is of course also a real milestone, just like Final Fantasy 8 when it comes to graphics. And the music is the stuff of legends. But for my part, Final Fantasy VII takes the cake by having a more relatable story about industry versus nature, hidden playable party members that make you feel extra special for unlocking them, and Materia is cool. I also always thought that Cloud was really cool, although he doesn't really hold the same appeal now that I'm older. Now, President Shinra is the cool one, a businessman who did nothing wrong. My favorite Final Fantasy game number 3, Final Fantasy VIII. So just like you ranked Final Fantasy VII above Final Fantasy VIII, I do the opposite, because I am a man of culture. Just kidding, this is just a list of personal favorites. But I wouldn't always have ranked VIII above VII. It actually took me a long time to really appreciate it, since there's so much in the game that you can miss or just have go over your head if you're not paying attention. It's a game that rewards being replayed, not only by letting you play around with the junction system, but also by having so much of the lore and plot stashed away off the beaten path in dialogue boxes with random NPCs and other reference materials in the game. Final Fantasy VIII is an exercise in mastery, both in terms of getting the most out of the junction system and in terms of wrapping your head around the story with all its different pieces spread across the game, making it a game I fall deeper in love with each time I play it. My favorite Final Fantasy game number two, Final Fantasy IX. My second favorite Final Fantasy is Final Fantasy IX, because of its magical medieval steampunk fantasy world filled with wonder and adventure. 
all the while masking a sinister undertone of existential dread, getting us to think about the meaning of life. The game also seems like maybe the most fully fleshed out Final Fantasy game of the PlayStation 1 generation, with great side content such as the search for Chocobo's Paradise, the Mognet mail delivery system, and the card game Tetra Master. Although Tetra Master could have had a bigger payoff. Just don't make me play Jump Rope. My favorite Final Fantasy game number two, Final Fantasy X. There is a case to be made that this is actually my favorite Final Fantasy game. At least you would be forgiven for thinking that after taking a look at the videos we've been making. And truth be told, I play this game a lot more than I do my actual favorite Final Fantasy game. It's always great to revisit the world of Spira. And the fact that it's fully 3D and has voiced dialogue makes it a lot easier to consume and to enjoy. Not that I don't also appreciate the older games. Also, I just want to take this opportunity to mention that Seymour is a great villain. He's a fantastic villain. So there's that. My favorite Final Fantasy game number one, Final Fantasy X. The characters, the world, the culture, the music, the voiceover. Yeah, even that scene, you uncultured swine that can't appreciate a good thing. Final Fantasy X is the game that has it all. The pilgrimage gives us a clear goal and takes us around Spira as if we were on a guided tour of an amazing world with a unique aesthetic and culture. From a gameplay perspective, I also really like the sphere grid, and there is so much you can do to power up your weapons, even though some of the minigames needed to do so aren't the best. And having things to kill, even when you're super overpowered, is also a lot of fun. Oh, and Jack looks like the fantasy version of my strangely tanned alcoholic father, so I can use that game to deal with my daddy issues. Oh yeah, he does look like dad. My favorite Final Fantasy game number one. Final Fantasy IX. My favorite Final Fantasy game is Final Fantasy IX, but I actually gave up the first time I played it. The reason was that I had just finished Final Fantasy X and got killed when I went to the bathroom because I forgot the game wasn't turn-based. I didn't pick the game up again for a while because I had also forgotten to save, so I had to replay it from the beginning all the way to the ice cavern. But when I gave it a real shot again, I found a game brimming with charm and with a life-affirming message that gave the story surprising weight. And it doesn't hurt that it's also Hironobu Sakaguchi's favorite, who incidentally also looks a bit like our dad. Oh yeah. Thanks for watching. We might have shown our age a bit with these titles, but it's called the Golden Age of Final Fantasy for a reason. Also, sorry for very similar lists, but we're brothers, so what did you expect? Honorable mentions to Final Fantasy XIII, and Final Fantasy VI, and Final Fantasy IV, and Final Fantasy XV, and Final Fantasy V, and Final Fantasy 1 through 3. And Final Fantasy 11, maybe. I haven't really played it. No one's gonna see this part because <laughs> they've all clicked away. But uh, uh, before you click away, don't forget to leave your top 5 favorite Final Fantasy games down in the comments below. But until next time, we leave you with some bird sounds. Kaka! <laughs>